Throughout the ages, history has been altered by word of mouth and the misrepresentation of those who might not have been present when some of the world's most significant events took place. Channelers Barry and Connie Strom bring through the spirits of those who actually witnessed or took part in these historical events and lets them tell their stories in their own words. Welcome to Channeling History, and now, here are your hosts, Barry and Connie Strong. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us on Channeling History. We're the only show where we speak to the souls that made things happen, and we are brought to you every Sunday on the Parax Radio Network at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm Barry Strong, your host, and I'm going to be doing the Speaking of the Words of the Spirit guest tonight. And I'm Connie Strom, your co-host, and I'd like to thank you all that take the time to listen to our show and even join us in the chat room where you can submit your questions for our guests. Please tell your friends about us. We would really appreciate it because we really would like to grow our audience and this history lesson that we're putting out. All of our shows are available for download on Potomatic.com and our YouTube channel, which is in Barry's name. In our last show, we channeled the Greek philosophers Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates. They discussed the philosophical advances of man during the last 2,500 years, as well as their opinions about what's taking place in our modern world. This was an outstanding show. If you missed it, the show's available on our YouTube channel or on Potomatic.com for download. Just search Channeling History. Now, tonight we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to delve into Russian history. We're going to speak with Leo Tolstoy and Tsar Nicholas II. Uh, Tolstoy is considered one of the greatest authors of all time. Uh, Our spirit guest was born in a well-known wealthy family of old Russian nobility and actually becomes a Christian anarchist and pacifist. His most notable works include War and Peace and Anna Karenia. He was nominated for the Nobel Prize for Literature five years in a row and a Nobel Peace Prize for three years. Many believe, and I'm, I think he's, they're probably correct, that he was the most talented author of all time. Now, Tsar Nicholas II was actually named Nicholas Romanov, and he was the last emperor of Russia. He ruled from 1894 until his abdication in 1917. He believed in strong autocratic rule, And at the time, there was a huge unrest in the world, and the common person was striving for political independence. He involved Russia in a war with Japan, and then got involved with Germany in World War I, where millions of Russian soldiers lost their lives. His family was killed by a Bolshevik firing squad in secrecy in 1918. A lot of mysteries around his death. His death ended over 300 years of Russian rule by the Romanov family and sadly ushered in the days of communist rule by Lenin and Stalin. Now, we always give a small disclaimer, and tonight's going to be no exception. The opinions or statements voiced on our show or the channel words of the spirits do not necessarily reflect our opinions, those of the Paranex, Parax Network, or of our sponsors. Before we channel, we always say a prayer of protection. So Connie's going to say the prayer, and we are going to begin to spirit to channel with spirit of Leo Tolstoy. God, please grant us your wisdom and protection. Grant us the knowledge that we can handle and keep us safe from all things that will harm us. Keep the message as positive and pure love. Keep us safe from our own egos. We ask these things in the light of the seen, the unseen, and the honesty of God. Okay, Leo, if uh, if you're prepared, then let's get started, Connie. Okay, Leo, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you were born in 1828 to a wealthy family in Russia. Will you please tell us what it was like in Russia as you were growing up and in your early life? If you were not wealthy in Russia, it was really a very difficult place. We had a system of serfdom where individuals were actually owned by the wealthy. 
It was very similar to your slave system that was in the south of the United States. The wealthy lived well. I was born into a a good family. We had land. We had plenty of serfs. We had servants. It was an aristocracy. The government, the head of the government, they were members of the Romanov family. They were they were monarchs. They the oldest male child would assume the throne. They were they were totally in charge of everything in the country. The political appointments were made by by the Romanovs. The wealth of, of the Romanov family was almost inconceivable. Moscow was a wonderful place. Moscow was the center of the Russian world. They had millions of people in the army. Young men were forced to join and fight. It was, as I said, if you were wealthy, it was a great place. If you weren't, you lived basically in poverty. Yeah. In 1851, you joined the Russian army, fought in the Crimean War, and participated in the siege of Sevastopol in 1854 to 1855. How did serving in the army affect your life? The siege of Sevastopol was was a scene of incredible brutality and killing. Both sides suffered greatly. The siege lasted for over six months. There were many, many people killed on both sides. I fought. I did the best I could. I saw my friends blown to pieces by artillery. As I watched what was taking place, I thought that humans were really basically animals. The devastation, the waste of life, it affected me de- deeply. Before I had joined the army, I must admit I was a bit of a playboy. I had the wealth to do it. I enjoyed myself. I had no real direction. As I watched what was taking place during the war, I asked myself many questions. How could God let this happen? I always believed in God, but it was just, I could not understand the violence. Russia seemed like it was always at war with somebody. It was, it was something that, that I just could not fathom, and it changed my life. From that time on, I basically became a pacifist. I wanted, I simply wanted war to go away. It's definitely understandable. In 2014, Russia seized the Crimea, and there have been attacks on Sevastopol. What do you think as you watch history repeat itself? I can't believe it's taking place again. I thought that perhaps at the end of the Soviet Union that Russia could solve some of its many problems. Those of us over here tried to guide the leadership. We tried to understand what it was that would make Russia a country 
where the people could truly prosper. Sadly, we watched as the leadership wanted to see how much money they could steal from the people, how much they could steal from the military. We watched as an old way of thinking came back. The leadership of Russia is deluded into thinking that the modern world would allow them to indiscriminately attack innocent people, to kill individuals for no reason. We watched as Russian leadership developed nuclear weapons, so many nuclear weapons far beyond any reasonable amount. And then we saw that the current leader, Putin, had no respect for his neighbors and actually no respect for the truth. In 2014, he attacked the Ukraine and seized Crimea. Yes, Crimea has always been historically important to the Russian nation. It was the home of the Black Sea Fleet. Our navies always used it. But he seized it with little resistance at the time. And I think he felt that the countries of the West would not offer a strong resistance if he attempted again to take more of the Ukraine. We were so saddened when we, when we watched Russia attack for no reason. We watch as the propaganda misleads the people of Russia. The people of Russia are really wonderful people. It's just that they have been so misled and lied to through the years. They live in fear. The current regime has got strong secret police. They enforce what they want to enforce. The laws mean nothing. Truth means nothing. Elected officials have no power. It was really sad to truly watch history repeat itself, especially since I had fought in Sevastopol. I think that what is taking place will have a terrible effect on the Russian people. Leo, after you left the army, you became what is referred to as a spiritual anarchist. What is a spiritual anarchist, and how did your views change so radically? When I saw what man was capable of in war, I thought that only pacifism, hating war, would have an effect. I became a radical spiritualist. I felt that it was only through serving God and not showing violence that man could exist. I tried to reflect that in my written works. I cannot describe to you how my serving in the army changed me. Understandable. Do you think God has forsaken Russia? I don't think God has truly forsaken Russia, but I think that he is allowing Russia to live up to its free will. As long as the people are unable to affect, truly affect the government of Russia, they cannot make progress. God will stand back and allow people to make the mistakes. Sometimes mistakes lead to good. Sometimes mistakes lead to bad. But I do think that 
Russia has a very difficult karma to face for what they are doing. So while I don't think God truly forsakes anyone or any country or anything, he will stand back and allow their karma to take place. That is true. Why did you come to believe nonviolence was the key to political change? I watched as countries such as France had violent revolutions. The aftermath of a violent revolution is always more violence. Different groups fight different groups. I felt that if everybody would not use violence, that perhaps conversation, negotiation, cooperation would be much easier. Violence is only met with violence. I had hoped that nonviolence would be met with nonviolence. Okay, we have a question from one of our listeners. Uh, Leo, do you think NATO caused this war in part by trying to bring the buffer state of Ukraine into its fold? Putin knows that he can never attack NATO because they are so strong and they will be and Russia will be truly destroyed. NATO never had any aspirations to attack Russia. The fact that Russia lies about NATO is what allows the Russian government to gain the support of the people. The people of Ukraine simply wanted to live in peace. They had a peace, a peace agreement with Russia. Russia lied to them. In 2014, they attacked them and took Crimea. And as you see, in 2022, they attempted to overtake the entire country. The fact that NATO caused this war is a great lie that is spoken by the Russian government. Okay. How did you try to help Mahatma Gandhi? And do you see him now that you're on the other side? Gandhi approached me as he was trying to gain independence for India. He believed in nonviolence as I did. And he asked me for some suggestions as how he could direct a nonviolent movement to gain success from Great Britain. And yes, we do see each other over here. Gandhi is a wonderful person. How did Victor Hugo's Les Miserables affect your life and literary work? Les Miserables wrote or brought the message of a violent revolution. I thought that violence at that, this time of my life was very, very difficult and simply did lead to other violence. In War and Peace, I tried to bring the truth of the war with France in the early 1800s. Millions of people were killed in that war. The Russians, the French, it was a horrible event for both. I thought that the French Revolution and the violence associated with it should be part of the message of peace that I attempted to bring through my writings. Okay. In the beginning of your novel, Anna Karenina, you state all happy families resemble each other. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Would you please explain this? Happy families basically follow the words of God. They follow very simple messages. 
They speak of love. They speak of truth. They speak of cooperation. They speak of coexistence. That is a very common message, and that common message usually leads to success. There are many, many ways to lead to unhappiness and failures. If you vary from the simple teachings that I just spoke of, then generally you find unhappiness. It can be through violence, can be through deceit, it can be through not helping others, it can be in many, many different ways. The pathway to happiness can be very simple, but there are infinite pathways to unhappiness. Okay, how can one live a moral life in an ethically imperfect world? It is very difficult. It takes willpower and it takes understanding of the true moral path. It is very simple, as I just said, to follow the teachings of God. Sadly, he's created evil. He's created wealth, greed, many, many different things. There is no doubt that the world is ethically imperfect. It is perhaps more ethically imperfect than at any other time because of the ability to acquire great wealth and for the effects of technology. One needs to live within their own shell. They need to lead their family on a path that they know is is a good path. And they need to make sure that the youth in their family understands the true path to happiness. Did you have psychic abilities? Yes, I would receive messages in my dreams. I never really truly understood what was taking place, but I would receive messages. I would see spirits. And yes, I did truly have psychic abilities. Okay. Throughout your life, you observed the suffering of others. That suffering still goes on today, as we were just talking about. Uh, What would you recommend to aid in the prevention of human suffering? I think that the greatest way to aid in ending human suffering would be to have people understand that the pathway towards evil, towards greed, towards great wealth, often results in a very, very poor judgment when you return after passing. I think that if people truly understood all of the aspects of the messages that God tries to bring to you and of God's wishes, that it would be much easier to help prevent the suffering that is going on today. People have great wealth. Countries have great wealth. There's really no need that anyone would suffer. The problem is having everyone understand that they have to contribute to a lifestyle that prevents suffering. It cannot be done simply by single individuals but it takes all to understand that if individuals cooperated in following the teachings of God, that it would truly be possible. You are a truly wise soul. Uh, We have another question from another listener. Was Napoleon trying to unite Europe, and did his General Berthier escape to America? Napoleon was trying to feed his own ego. 
Napoleon was trying to conquer evil, Europe and Russia. There is a huge difference between conquering and uniting. And I am not aware of what happened to Berthier. Okay. Uh, you attempted to organize schools for peasant children. What do you think of our educational system today, and how would you change it? I think that the educational system today is in immense de decay throughout the world. You have teachers trying to propagandize children. You have teachers trying to take away the lessons of history. It is only through understanding what has taken place in the past that the future can be assured. Until governments understand that education has to simply be teaching of the truth, teaching of cooperation, and teaching on what individuals need to understand how to advance, that education will truly become effective. Hey, the Russian people seem to be very much in favor of this current war. Do you see any hope for the Russian people in the future? The hope for the Russian people is in them learning the truth. As long as there is no challenge to the government telling them all of the lies, as long as that government can enforce those lies with secret police and military, then the Russian people have little hope for change. Okay. Uh, do you see any possibility that the Russian people will revolt at any time in the near future? The politicians and the, the, and the military are so absolutely strong at this time that it would be very difficult. If they continue to lie to the people and if they continue to destroy the way of life of the people, there will be a time that the military will join the people and there will be an uprising. It is only after the military and the police understand that their way to a better life is through getting rid of the government, that there will ever be a chance. What is your opinion of Putin? Putin is a very difficult individual. He has got himself into a corner that he cannot get out of. He totally underestimated what was going to happen when he attacked the Ukraine. He totally underestimated what would happen with the Western powers in defending the innocent people of Ukraine. He has got, he is ill at this time. He has got major sicknesses that are hidden from the people. He, he has many emotional problems because he realizes that he basically has no way out. Okay. How would you prevent graft and corruption in modern Russia if you were running it? I would start by trying to tell the people the truth. I would use the propaganda organization to explain the situation the Russian people are in, to tell them what changes they need to make, and to tell them how they can honestly bring the Russian country back into the better graces of the other countries in the world. I think everything starts with the truth. Once the people truly understand the truth, there is a chance, maybe a slim chance, but there is definitely a chance that Russian can return to greatness. Leo, we really appreciate you joining us this evening. Do you have a final message for our listeners? Yes. I was truly a Russian person. I loved Russia. Now that I'm on the other side, I still love Russia. 
There are many things that I do not love about it. I do not love what has become of the government. I do not appreciate the lies that are being told to the people. I wish that it would be possible for individuals to take over the government that truly care about the people. Throughout history, the common person in Russia has been abused. They have been lied to. They have been physically harmed. They've been forced to serve in the military. They've been killed in battles. They've been taken advantage of. A more democratic form of government is the only way that Russia can ever advance into the modern world. They have to have people in their government to care and do not care more about stealing as much as they can and gain as great wealth as possible. It is going to be far easier said than done, but it is the only way that the people of Russia are ever going to advance. Okay, thank you, Leo. Wonderful, wonderful session. Let's take a small break here, and we'll be back in a couple minutes. Don't go away. Channeling History will return right after these brief messages. In order for the light to shine so brightly, the darkness must be present. Tune in every Monday at 10 o'clock for Dark Sun Rising on the Para-X Radio Network. Hi, this is Marla Brooks from Stirring the Cauldron. Thursdays are a great night on the Para-X Radio Network. We start off the evening with Journey into the Light, Chapter 3, with your hosts, Psychic Little T and Tabby Cat Gash at 7 p.m. Eastern. Then, on the first and third Thursdays of the month at 8 p.m., it's Tango and Friends, hosted by Bruce Tango. And on the alternate Thursdays at 8 p.m., tune in to Stirring the Cauldron, the Archive podcast. Every week at 9 p.m. Eastern, join me on Stirring the Cauldron Live. And then at 10 p.m., stick around for New Aeon Now with Lily Alley, Davron Michaels, and Christine Matza. Finally, to round out the night, join Dr. Kelly Renee Schutz on the Paranormal Encounters podcast. All this, every Thursday, right here on Para-X. Hello, everyone. Barry Strom here. For the past years, I've been using my gift of spirit communication to bring you the words of many historic and holy spirits. I recently finished my eighth book and possibly most important book, Message of God for a Modern World. The book contains 60 messages of God that I've personally channeled. It's a superb, non-denominational devotional that will bring you a new understanding of the afterlife and how to bring happiness following God's simple words. The soft cover and ebook are available on Amazon and personalized copies are available on my website, barrystrom.com. If you follow these messages, you will truly understand God's plan for all of us. Welcome back to Channeling History. Now, here are your hosts, Barry and Connie Strom. Okay, everybody, welcome back. Uh, Connie, let's begin with Tsar Nicholas. Okay, Nicholas, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you were a Romanov. The Romanovs ruled Russia for hundreds of years. What was it like growing up as a member of the Romanov family? It's almost impossible to describe the wealth, the standard of living. We had the absolute best of everything you can imagine. We had many, many servants with many, many serfs. It was truly a, a life of opulence. As I look back on it from this side, I can see that it was truly a way of life that injured many, many people. The way we lived basically made the Russian people slaves. We were judged for it when we returned. We knew, we knew that it was creating problems, but we did nothing. We did nothing. 
meaningful to end it. We thought it would go on forever, but we were certainly very wrong. Would you tell us about the surf system in Russia? The common people were basically slaves to the landholders. There was no way that the common person could own land unless it was given to them by a member of royalty or a landowner. The serfs had to do what their masters told them to do. They were basically slaves. They were uneducated. They were kept uneducated because we thought that if they obtained educations that they could be a risk to our way of life. It was, it was a terrible system. Sadly, we did nothing to change it. Okay. Russia was a monarchy ruled by the Romanov family. You assumed the reign of Russia in, 19, in 1894. Did you attempt to make any changes in the way Russia was ruled at that time? I tried to do some things to make life easier for the, the common person. I tried to make some simple changes, tried to bring them some education, tried to provide ways that they could own properties, tried to find ways that they could feel that they were participating in government. I let them make suggestions about governmental changes, but I never gave any elected assemblies any power. I felt that I had the supreme ability to make decisions, that I was, my word was 100% law. I did, I did many things that I realized later I should not have done. Yes, we have a question from our chat room. What level of heaven are you in? I'm in the third level. Okay. Did you feel you were prepared to rule Russia? No. I did not expect that I would have to take over at that time. I have to admit that my personality was not the best for taking over leadership of a huge and complex country such as Russia. No one understands the immensity of the country. It goes from the Pacific to the Mediterranean. In those days, it was huge. Many areas required different types of government. I, I relied too heavily on my advisors. They would tell me sometimes what I wanted to hear. I had, I had no ambition to change my lifestyle. I felt that we knew what was best for the country. And in many instances, we did not. Did you feel that elected officials should play any role in the governing of Russia? No. I felt that we should have elected officials that could advise, but I felt that they should have absolutely no permanent effect on the decisions that were made in running the country. I would make the decisions, good or bad. Okay. Looks like our chat room is really interested in your visit. Uh, another question from there. Were the Bolsheviks actually communists? They were driven by the communists, yes. Okay. Did you believe that God chose you to be the czar and therefore your decisions reflected the will of God and could not be disputed? Absolutely. I thought that I was so wrong. 
I realized immediately when I, I was killed, the, the errors of what it was, of how I was running the country. When you are raised in an environment where you are, everything is done for you, people tell you what you want to hear, where you are, people build up your egos, people tell you how amazing you are, it, it affects your decision making. You're seeing it today. You're seeing where people of great wealth think that whatever they do is sufficient, is fine in the eyes of God or in anybody else. Many people don't even believe in God when they acquire great wealth. So, you see, I'm not making an excuse. I'm telling you what happened. I'm telling you how I governed. And I'm telling you that I was wrong, just as many, many people are wrong in how they believe in only themselves. Another question from a listener. What happened to Anastasia? Anastasia was shot and killed. Okay. Why did you get into a long-distance war with Japan? And how did that war end? My advisors told me that we would be able to easily defeat Japan. We had a fleet, a Pacific fleet, that they told was much stronger than Japan. They told us that they were very poor fighters, they told us many things that I believed. It was a huge mistake. We could not get supplies across the whole of Asia. We made a huge mistake going to war with Japan. Why did the people turn against you? The losses were probably the largest reason. We lost many, many soldiers in Japan. Then I made the decision that we would join into the First World War. It was a terrible, terrible war. We would lose hundreds of thousands of men. We would, we were losing. It looked like Moscow would be destroyed. It looked like we were going to have the end of the Russian country. It was not... I made very a lot of poor decisions. The people finally had had enough. Okay, let's see. Um, you were forced by revolution to abdicate the throne of Russia. Do you see any chance of revolution in modern Russia? I do not see it in the immediate future. I think that history is a repeating itself. If modern Russia continues to send hundreds and hundreds of thousands of the youth of Russia to their death, for no apparent reason, then I think you will have a chance that the people could arise. Today, sadly, Russia is simply repeating its prior history. They are invading countries for no reason. They are killing the innocent. They're creating war crimes. They are actually arming convicts to serve in the, in the army. These people can return to the country with their arms. The possibility will increase exponentially for revolution as they, the country continues to repeat the historical mistakes of the past by forcing the young people to die in meaningless 
wars. Okay. Okay. During World War I, the Russian army sustained major losses. The people of Russia suffered from inflation and shortages. This seems similar to what's taking place in Russia today with the war in Ukraine. What do you think will result from the similarities of today's Russia? As I said, history is repeating itself. What has happened throughout the ages in Russia? They've gone to war. They've suffered huge losses. The people were in po- are in poverty, and they turn on the government. I do not understand why the modern government of Russia cannot understand this. They think that the power of their secret police and the military will protect them. But what they forget is that many of the families of those that they count on to protect them are being driven into poverty. Why did you decide to abdicate in March of 1977, 1917? The people were turning against me. They were... There were riots going on throughout the country. The soldiers were beginning to refuse to fight. They were joining together to overthrow the government. They were trying to give powers to the elected officials. They were forming groups. They were forming parties. There were many that were advocating violence, I really had little choice. I had to advocate. I thought that if I did that, I would be protected and it would save my family. So that's why you did not go into exile? Yes. I thought I had the chance to go into exile, but I thought that I could stay. I thought that I could be of some help. And I never thought that my family would be in danger. If I had thought that the Bolsheviks, the communists, the socialists, that, they, that all they wanted was to take over and to eliminate anyone associated with the, with the old monarchy, I would truly have gone into exile. Yeah. Who were the Bolsheviks? They were a group of revolutionaries. They were individuals who felt that the common person should try to run the government. They felt that communism or a type of socialism would be the best way to govern the country. But most importantly, they felt that the monarchy should cease to exist. Would you please describe your death and the death of the members of your family? After I advocated the throne, they were very good to us. We maintained uh, many of our servants. We maintained pretty much our way of life. We were basically under house arrest, but we were allowed to walk the gardens. In the beginning, not much changed. Eventually, they started to take away our servants. They started to enforce stronger rules. They actually took us out of Moscow. They took us into a secluded area where we were allowed to live in this mansion. But as time went on, we were restricted in many, many different ways. One evening, early in the morning, they come. They came to us and told my whole family to come down into a room down in the lower level. We thought they simply wanted to speak with us. But they had set up a firing squad. These individuals entered the room and suddenly started shooting. 
I was the first to die. I was hit with many bullets. But then they commenced to, to kill my family members. And our several of our faithful servants that were still with us. They destroyed my entire family in a five-minute period. I think that Alexei and my daughter were not initially killed. I think that they were taken not far away, abused, and then killed. They tried to destroy the remains of our family, and it was not until many, many years later that our remains were actually discovered. Mm. It was... It was a terrible scene of violence. What do you consider the greatest mistakes that you made as czar? I think the fact that I thought that everything, that all of my decisions were of God and that I was not to be questioned was probably the greatest mistake. I should never have become so involved in the two wars the wars accounted for millions of people being killed. Each time an individual is killed, the families are affected. If enough families are affected, it be, there is a time that revolution will, will take place. And there will be major changes through violence in any country. That has been the lesson of history. If I had been more open, if I had listened to others that gave good advice, I think that a possibility would have been that we could have governed for a longer period of time. But it was truly inevitable that the monar monarchy of Russia was going to be taken away. Okay. Uh, do you see any similarities between you and Putin? Sadly, I do. I failed to take advice from advisors that I should have listened to. As we watch from over here, we see that he does not take advice from advisors that he should be listening to. I was surrounded by people that did not disagree with me. He is surrounded by people that do not, sit, not disagree with him. He, is, he has isolated himself, much as I isolated myself, as things were turning against me. He is not showing any inclination to compromise or to change his, 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 his plans of government. I did the same thing. He is lying and misleading the people. I did that as well. He is trying to conquer lands that he should not be trying to conquer. I did that as well. So you see there are actually many similarities between Mr. Putin and myself. I'm very sorry to admit that, but I suspect that he will meet the same demise as I did. Okay, we're running out of time, so we can't get to some more questions that we had. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but do you have a final message for our listeners? Yes, I would like to thank you for allowing me to speak. We It's been an awful long time since we could speak and bring messages to others. I made many mistakes as, governor, as I was governing Russia. Today you're seeing the Russian government make many, many mistakes as well. I would hope that the Russian government will understand that the answer 
is not taking advantage of the people. We took advantage of the people for hundreds of years, and we paid the price for it with death. I would hope that Putin and the current regime would understand that they have got themselves in a position in which they cannot win. They have to withdraw their forces. They have to ask for peace. And they have to get back into the goodwill of the rest of the world. The United countries are very, very powerful today. And there is no way that a country such as Russia can defeat them. If they use nuclear weapons, Russia will cease to exist. And all of their families will die, and I hope they understand that. So thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you for allowing Leo and myself to come forward. I hope that you have a better understanding of Russia and the Russian people. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Okay, next week is Super Bowl Sunday. So we're not going to be live on the air. CC is going to play a rerun for us. But in two weeks, we're going to interview the spirit of famous boxer Muhammad Ali, also known as Cassius Clay, and the famous baseball slugger Lou Gehrig. Both of these individuals have got incredible life plans that they lived. Gehrig died of a debilitating disease, and Cassius Clay almost gave up his entire future in order to follow the Muslim faith. It's going to be a very, very interesting show. Please tell your friends about it. I think you're going to find it very inspirational. Connie and I are starting a new project on the Voice America Variety Network on Tuesdays at 9 a.m. Pacific Time. Our new show is called Spirit Speak, Analyzing the Afterlife. This week, we're going to have Sean Whittington, the famous exorcist, on as a guest. Tell your friends about it. It's a, if you like channeling history, you're going to also like analyzing the afterlife. You can submit questions and suggestions for future guests through our email, channeling history on parax at gmail.com. My eighth book, Messages of God for a Modern World, is now available on Amazon. It contains 60 channeled messages of Jesus, and it is an absolutely wonderful daily devotional. Signed copies of it are available on my website, barrystrom.com. Okay, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please join us. We'll be live again in two weeks. Super Bowl does take priority. We'll be back in two weeks at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on the Parax Radio Network. And I would also like to thank you all for joining us this evening. I hope you all have a wonderful week. God bless you all. Thanks for listening to Channeling History. Tune in again next week for another electrifying episode as we never know who will make an appearance or who will come through the portal. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2020. Our story begins by Kevin McLeod, licensed through Incompetech.com. Incompetech.com.